to minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Hi, this is James Travis coming at you with a new free form. It'll be free form number 19, 19 times. I've gone down this road where I just start babbling and seeing what happens. And this time, uh, I'm doing the same. I don't know what I'm going to say. I just know that it's been a couple of days since I've done any commentary. Uh, that's because I've been working on improving the uh, the overall appearance of my uh, poetry and, and commentary. Uh, I'm not quite there yet. I'm still working at it. But I've uh, I've gone through any number of programs to work on, on paint and things of that sort. Uh, you know, what, what would be uh, Photoshop, it's commonly known as, but I'm using a free version of it. And so it's, um, you know, I'm not the most technically gifted guy in the world, as in gifted in technology. I'm really not. I'm uh, There are two things, and I'm actually three things that I'm really not very good at in life. And one is directions. My wife can tell you this. I, I get lost going to the bathroom. I just, <laughs> I really, if you put me in a restaurant I don't know and tell me the bathroom is that way, you, you'll find me like, you know, uh, three stores down in a, in a, in a you know, in a, in a, in a safe way or something like that. It's just, I'm just terrible. I have no clue about directions and I never have. Um, I'm actually, uh, you know, I, I would put my, I think that we have different intelligences, different things that, you know, uh, you know, some people are really kinetically intelligent. Some people are really, uh, you know, uh, intelligent in the way they use words. Some people are uh, athletically intelligent. Some people are uh, uh, intelligent at theory or abstract ideas some people are uh, talented at creativity some people are talented at uh you know spirituality so we have different kinds of intelligences and um not everybody is equally intelligent intelligent in one area as they are in the other i happen to be extremely creatively intelligent but i also happen to be extremely uh navigationally challenged and uh, i'm not alone in this uh gk chesterton for instance used to call his wife um from a payphone and say um where am I supposed to be exactly? <laughs> what train am I supposed to take home? And she had to tell him what train to take home. And this is one of the greatest uh, thinkers of the 20th century, with bar none, without a doubt. G.K. Chesterton is one of the top five thinkers of the 20th century. You know, he's up there with Einstein, people like that. Uh, he's absolutely an incredible, um, almost overwhelming uh, uh, fount of uh, wisdom and, and, and uh, thought. It's incredible. He, just, he would just sit down and he would write reams and reams and reams and reams of brilliant stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, book after book after book. Uh, many of the books challenging. You know, I've talked about Chesterton a little bit on this channel with the ball and the cross that I'm reading now, and um, a couple other things. But he's a uh, he's a profound thinker. But he, you know, he had trouble getting around getting around his own hometown because he just wasn't intelligent in that direction. Um, and so I have trouble with these uh, technological things. I I'm not um, I'm not a natural at it. It's it's not intuitive to me. Uh, my daughter rolls her eyes at me. She thinks you know it's like you know my, it's like my wife rolls her eyes at my direction challenges. They, they a lot of people don't realize that. When you're um, stupid, and in some ways I am stupid, um, you you're not faking it to get out of something. You're not. To, it's actually very hard to do anything. Um, so I've always had a great compassion for for stupid people, um, as long as their stupid uh, stupidity is not mendacious, as long as it's not um, directed toward the evil. It, you know, I just uh, I just think you know it'd be like it'd being angry at a stupid person is like being angry at a person with you know missing both legs. Uh, and not being able to run, you know, how can you be mad at somebody who can't run when they have no legs? And the same thing with a stupid person. How can you be mad at a stupid person who um, is, you know, just doesn't have the um, capacity to think very well? And, 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 you know, but, you know, the difference between somebody with no legs and somebody with no brain, or at least no brain in, in a certain direction, uh, is, you know, it's one thing when you get lost and now you're walking around Safeway and you can't find, you know, the bathroom or whatever and it's another thing when you're um, trying to set up uh, a uh, an ec you know a, an economic system for your country <laughs> that's never worked anywhere uh, and you're going to bring up about all kinds of hardship for the world so you, you, there's certain levels of stupidity that you can't um, you can't stomach you can't um, you can't take but this is what academics miss a lot of times they miss the fact that although they're very intelligent in a certain direction and that they're able to parrot uh, large amounts of material uh, they may not be all that intelligent in other ways uh, to be able to see cause and effect, for instance, as a certain kind of intelligence. They may not have that uh, intelligence at all. You know, they're the kind of person who's you know puts their hand in the fire, and go ouch, and then you know ten minutes later put their hand in the fire, fire and go ouch. And you say, why did you do that again? You did it, stupid. 
and uh, then you say, well, you know, I, I just forgot, you know, or I didn't know, or, or um, I thought it would be different this time. You know, this is what you get with socialism, right? It's just, you know, I thought it would be different this time. I thought it would be different this time. They always end up killing people. They always end up, you know, people starving, people bankrupt, people miserable, people running from their country, people, you know, you know, nobody, you know, nobody with healthcare, nobody with any kind of toilet paper or basic necessities, and and yet somehow they always think it's going to work in the next place. Uh, that kind of lack of intelligence on a on a on a large scale is extremely dangerous. Uh, as a, but you know, my lack of te technological um, expertise usually results in a well, it usually ex results in a, a not a um, terrific looking poem, which is not the end of the world. Um, so I've been trying to get better at that. I've been trying to get better at uh, these these kinds of things. Uh, I've been trying to get better as a speaker. I know that sometimes I say you know a lot. I say oh, a lot. I say I skip over my words. You know, I listen to these talks. I probably listen to these talks more than anybody else listens to them. And I listen to them to try to improve. I try not to, not to, you know, not to say, so, wow, listen to the sound of my voice. I actually don't like the sound of my voice. Not many people do like the sounds of their own voices. But I, um, I definitely, you know, I just did an um and a pop. And that's the kind of thing that I would like to lose. I would like to become better at that kind of thing. Anyway, so that's what I was doing. Um, you know, I was in, you know, even though I, I had, a, had a kind of a pissy uh, moment there, a couple of things back, it had nothing to do with me not uh, doing one of these talks. It's just I've just been busy. I've been trying to do this. I've been trying to, you know, to learn to, to get better. Maybe that brings in a better, audience, bigger audience if I'm, I'm better at it. Maybe it doesn't. I, I don't know that at this point uh, it does. Look, I, you know, the people who like poetry do not agree with me on my politics. I understand that. I understand that they don't agree with me in my theology, and I understand that as well. Uh, and and so. You become persona non grata. I mean, I've lost friends in the poetry world that I had for years and years and years, and I've lost friends that were very close friends, people who really liked me. You know, I'm thinking of someone like Laura Orham, who I was very, I was very good friends with on Facebook, and it's a Facebook friendship, not a real life friendship. Uh, you know, not face to face, but you know, this, you know, when you lose a friend like that, somebody who is posting on your wall every day, and and somebody who you've supported their work and they've supported yours, and then all of a sudden, you know, you take a stand against. Uh, you know, the euthanasia of the old, because you think it's going to be uh, abused, and old people are going to be forced into their own deaths, uh, which is the way I see it uh, going. I don't see it as a, a dignity thing. I think it's a, I think it's a, it, the potential uh, for tragedy there is immense. You know, I just, I just read a poem uh, called Sophocles, uh, reading Oedipus at Colonus, and that poem is about the young Iophone, uh, well, I say young, but he may have been in his 60s or 70s, um, who says of his father Sophocles that he's senile, that he can't handle his own affairs anymore, so therefore it should go to Iophone. And uh, Sophocles, 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 it's a true story by the way, Sophocles goes to the, um, to the court to um, prove his own um, mind, to prove his own sanity. And while he's there, to prove this, he pulls out his newest, his, late, his last play, which was Sophocles at Colonus. And he reads Sophocles at Colonus to them, and they love it. It's just, um, you know, it's just your regular, brilliant, genius Sophocles. And everything he wrote was genius, at least everything has come down to us. And you got to figure, it's just a tragedy more that hasn't come down to us, because he was absolutely, stunningly brilliant. Um, so, you know, the, you know, but he, he passed that. But do you think, in the, in, in the way the left envisions the world, you know, with euthanasia, they would have, they would have browbeat Sophocles into, you know, sucking down some poison or something to get rid of him because he's, you know, and I just don't, th I think the chances of abuse for that are terrible. So anyway, that is what made Laura say, you know, you're an asshole. I'm not talking to you anymore. And, and of course that hurt. Uh, I'm not one of those people that says, well, you know, good riddance to bad rubbish. You know, I'm not one of those people. I think that people um, are, you know, they have their points of view. I respect them. But I, I, you know, I, I often think, you know, sometimes they're wrong, sometimes they're right, sometimes in, in the middle. But, uh, you know, I'm not one of those people that decides, well, you know, you don't agree with me, so, you know, you can get lost. Or they, they decided to dump me, therefore they're not worth anything. I've never felt that way. I, never felt, I didn't feel that way about my first wife when she dumped me. I feel that way about girlfriends when they dump me. Uh, by the way, I've never dumped anybody in my life. Never, not once, have I dumped anybody. I've always been an extremely loyal person. And so it's not an easy thing for me to um, accept that large numbers of people are turning away from me because of uh, what I believe, but you know, you have to accept it. And so I've been, uh, you know, I've been trying to get better and I've been trying to, you know, for my own personal satisfaction, it has nothing to do with, I don't, it has very little to do with bringing in, in an audience. I just want to create the best stuff I can create. I'm a perfectionist in a lot of ways uh, that has its positive sides and its negative sides, but the positive side of that is I really want to produce something that is worthwhile and something that people can come to a hundred years from now and say, you know, well, this is very archaic type of technology, but the um, but it's well done. It's uh, you know, I, you know, I get the point of the poem, and I get the um, uh, so you know, my great great grandchild says, hey, I wonder what that old poet, you know, 
ancestor of mine wrote back in the day, and he comes across, you know, Sophocles reading Oedipus at Colonus, and he's like, oh, man, not too bad. That would be good for me. That would, that would work. Uh, so that's been going on. I've been, you know, I've been busy. I've been, um, you know, I've also been, uh, you know, trying to uh, catch up with some of the stuff that I've not been able to do because it's been so hot, uh, you know, like clean and, and, and that kind of stuff. I'm doing a little more cooking, uh, a little more, uh, you know, basically other stuff that, and I've had, uh, I got a lot of, I bought a lot of stuff, so I've been working on that. I got a uh, new camera. That's exciting. So I'll be able to, um, you know, spend the next, you know, uh, few days on that. Actually, I got a new mattress. So I, I, we took the old mattress and we put it in my office because I have to, you know, you have to deliver that to the, to the, to the um, recycling. And uh, we haven't been able to do that yet. So I got this big mattress in my office. Uh, and, you know, we put the new mattress in the, in the bedroom. And uh, so I haven't been able really to try out my camera because I don't want to take pictures with the big mattress in my office. So I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want to film it with, uh, with that in a way. So, um, so, but I, I got the new camera. I got a, uh, I got an awesome little uh, boom box that's waterproof, so you can take it in the shower, you can take it to the pool, you can do that kind of thing. But I found if you just put it in your pocket, you can just walk around listening to stuff, which is important for me because, you know, if I'm cleaning the kitchen or I'm, I'm vacuuming the rugs or maybe not vacuuming, I haven't done that recently, but it, it, if you're doing something, you know, a little gardening, watering the flowers or whatever, you can just walk around with this thing in your pocket and it's just... It, you know, I try to take in as much content from other people as possible. Uh, so I'm not just talking about, you know, YouTube stuff, but I'm talking about uh, all kinds of reading, literature, you know, old-time radio, on and on. And so I'm constantly trying to have input into my uh, thing. And so, so to, to the point where I say, you know, sometimes you've got to you gotta step back from that and have a little quiet time. Uh, because it's very hard to get your own thoughts in line unless you do that. But um, certainly... Um, this is this is a wonderful little device, and it's called a hydro hydro something. Um, yeah, I think I got it here. Uh, no, maybe not. Anyway, it's a it's a Bluetooth hydro beat, and it's blue in color, and it's it just it's just a wonderful little boombox thing. And like I said, I can put it in the shower and take showers and and listen to uh, you know whatever content I want to listen to. And then on top of that, I got a, a, a dictaphone. Uh, kind of thing, a, a voice recorder, but that thing doesn't work, and it's very annoying because it's really looking forward to it. It was, it was you could put it on a lanyard and wear it around your neck, and I was planning on taking it on my walks because I get ideas on my walks all the time, and then I just, you know, forget them as I, you know, go through my walk. I'm usually listening to something at the time, so I was thinking I would wear this around a lanyard and and, and talk into it and record my ideas and then keep, you know, walking. But apparently, um, yeah, this thing doesn't work, and so I'm going to have to uh, have to return it and then uh, hopefully get another one that can do the same thing. And, uh, you know, there's a few other things I got as well, but, you know, so I've been, you know, working on that equipment is in addition to doing the, um, you know, the other stuff where, so all this stuff is eating up time like crazy. I'm not even getting any writing done, really. It's a little annoying. Um, it's been a bad year for writing in general. I've not, I've not kept up with the writing as well as I should have, uh, but, uh, you know, I'm still waiting on submissions. I'm still waiting on some stuff to come back. I plan on getting back into it deeper when, uh, September rolls around and we drop my daughter off at the, uh, university and then I'll have, you know, I'm going to. I'm going to slow down with the uh, with the cooking. There won't be a family here, so it'll just be, you know, my wife and I, and I can, you know, whip up stuff for us pretty quickly. So, um, you know, that's what's going on right now. Uh, I don't uh, I don't have a whole lot in the way of um, other things to talk about. I guess I could talk a little bit about, you know, all the stuff going on with Trump, and, uh, you know, I don't know. Here, here's my idea, okay? Let's say, let's say, like Manafort or something of that nature, Manafort or Cohen. Let's say you get Trump on some small thing. Let's say you get him on, you know, he has some full, small financial um, peccadillo in his campaign financing, right? And let's say that you can you can nail him on that, okay? And let's say the Democrats win back the House in November. And let's say they impeach him. Um, and let's say you convince enough never-Trumpers in the Senate to go along with removing him from office, do you think, for one moment, that's a good thing? Because let me tell you something. I'm, I'm clued into the right enough. I don't, I, you know, I try to keep up. I try to keep informed. I told you I walk around with my, my, my boom box now, but I've been doing this for a long time, where I try to keep up with both sides, and I try to understand both sides, and I try to understand um, things from both angles. Um, and I, I include that in Christian, non-Christian, liberal, conservative, um, Republican, Democrat. You know, every everything that I want to think about, I try to consider on both sides. And I'm, so I'm clued into the right. And let me tell you something. If you remove Donald Trump, disaster for this country. If you remove him, it's going to look exactly like what it is, which is a legal coup of the president of the United States. 
And you don't have many people who are, um, you don't have a majority of the country who is dynamically and excitedly pro-Trump. It's about 30%, maybe 35% tops. But that 35% loves that guy. They love him. They think he's awesome. And if you, let me tell you something, 35 percent 35% of the country is a crap load of people, okay? We live in a nation of 320 or 330 million people. 30% of that would be what, 100 million? Somewhere around that? 100 million, you know, so, so you're talking about, yeah, 60 something million voted for him, but there's like 100 million that are, you know, approve of him. You remove him and you are going to have a whole heck of a lot of screaming, banshee Trump supporters who are absolutely livid at their country. I mean, you think that the resistance is mad because Donald Trump won the election? Imagine how mad these people are going to be if you overturn a legal election and remove their guy from basically nothing. For basically nothing. You could say, oh, it's something. Uh, no, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing. Let me put it this way. Hillary Clinton, the stuff that Hillary Clinton did is far, far, far worse than anything Donald Trump did. The stuff that Barack Obama did is far worse than anything Donald Trump did that he would be removed for. The stuff that Bill Clinton did, far worse. The stuff that George Bush did, far worse. The stuff that you, you can almost go down the line. You have to go to Reagan. And now, even Reagan, you could say that the Iran-Contra affair is probably far worse than anything Trump has done. So there was literally, you have to go back. I don't know who you can go back to before you end up, maybe Jimmy Carter doesn't have the scandal that, um, that this would be, maybe. But he was absolutely incompetent as president. You're not talking about a guy who's incompetent as president. You're not. You're talking about a guy who's absolutely been brilliant as president. I'm just sorry. I mean, I, you know, that's the way I see it. He's been brilliant as president. He, the economy is great. We are not having any new wars. There's a real chance for peace in places where there were never chances of peace before. He's bringing back jobs that Obama told us were gone forever. If you remove this guy from office over a peccadillo, over a small um, infraction in the election laws, you will never, ever, ever recover from that. There will be at least, at least 30 million Americans who are permanently disillusioned with the system. And they will all be Republicans and they will all move further right. Extremist right. You think you have a problem with white nationalists now? You have no idea. Go ahead and remove Donald Trump. I have said all along that Donald Trump is a moderate reformer. That's what he is. He's a moderate reformer. He's not a, he's not a radical reformer. He's a moderate one. He has said, look, we are on the wrong path here. We have to take moderate steps to get back on the right path. And he's done this sometimes with with, with um, hyperbolic rhetoric and uh, stuff like that. But he's not a an extremist in any sense or shape, sense or form. You know, you, in fact, if you remove him, you're probably going to put in a guy who's more of an extremist in Pence. Uh, let me tell you something. Pence was president right now. I don't know who would be on the Supreme Court, but uh, be nominated for the Supreme Court, but it probably would not be Kavanaugh. It would probably be Amy Coney Barrett or somebody who is far more to the right than Kavanaugh was. And as me, as somebody who um, hates abortion, uh, I would, I'd be fine with that. But I'm not sure that if you're on the um, on the left, you'd be fine with that. So you're playing with fire here, you know, because you just can't get control of your emotions. You can't get control. You can't see far enough into the future to understand that you're creating a uh, a um, a situation that is absolutely a powder keg for the country and if you want to go down that road you're going to go down that road but this is not bill clinton bill clinton deserved to be removed from office what he did was unconscionable all right it wasn't just that he um had a small problem here or there bill clinton was a rapist okay this is straight up bill clinton raped women bill clinton used women in a purient and disgusting manner while he was president he stuck a cigar inside an intern a woman he was he was the superior, the far superior of, in the Oval Office. Not in a motel room, but inside the Oval Office itself. He took a cigar and he put it in the woman's vagina and put it in his mouth and said, mm, tastes good. That was in the Oval Office this happened. Okay? He lied to the American people. He lied under oath, which is a felony. And he did this all, you know, on top of all the other things that he had done. The raping Juanita Broderick. The uh, sexual assaults on Paula Jones and 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 all and Jennifer Flowers and all the you know that affair and everything else and then if you look at you know all the stuff that's on the side of the Clintons ever since, listen, I'm not saying uh, you know and even still even after all that, 
Republicans impeaching him. And people forget Bill Clinton was impeached. He was not removed from office, but he was impeached. One of two presidents to ever be impeached. The other one was Andrew Johnson, not Richard Nixon. He resigned before he could be impeached. He, you know, despite the fact that he was uh, impeached, despite the fact that he had been all, he had done all these things, and he had been such a horrendous person, and he disgraced the office so much, and he had uh, committed a felony that was absolutely foolproof, and despite the fact that there was, you know, all this evidence that he had done even more than that, and despite the fact that there was Travelgate and there was, you know, Vince Foster issues and stuff of like that, despite all of that. The Republicans still paid a heavy price for impeaching him. They did. Oh, George W. Bush narrowly won the presidency, you know, a couple years later. But otherwise, the Republican Revolution that started under uh, Gingrich ended there. It ended there. American people were not happy about Republicans overturning an election. They just weren't. Even though it was deserved. Even though Bill Clinton was probably... As far as character goes, personal character, he was the most, the least honorable man to ever be president. There's nobody even close to him I can think of. I can't think of anybody. You know, JFK, you know, cheated on his wife a bunch of times, but he didn't do it in the Oval Office. You know, he didn't do it with a cigar that I know of. He didn't do, you know, he was he was not an especially honorable man in that way. But he was not Bill Clinton bad. You know, you look at, you know, even, you know, you can say what you want about Jimmy Carter or Barack Obama. You can say what you want about Andrew Jackson or Woodrow Wilson. But when you look at their personal lives, you don't see the kind of the mess um, that you got with Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton was a bad human being. He really is. He's a bad guy. And yet when he was, you know, there was a good economy at the time. There was no war at the time. And so the American people are like, why are you messing with a good thing? And you can argue about the virtues of that all you want. And you can argue about the virtues of doing it to Trump. But I'm telling you that the American people, if, 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 this, if this is what happens, if you remove Donald Trump, and all of a sudden, we end up in war, or we end up in um, bad, the economy turns bad, or anything else happens. Or you have Ebola run wild. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, and and they're gonna, every Trump supporter, you know, the millions and millions of them are going to say, this is because you removed Donald Trump. We are having these problems now because you removed Donald Trump. You did this. And you're going to own every single thing that goes wrong from now until who knows when. And you should think about that. You should think about whether that's something that you um, you want to have on your movement. Because the left is struggling as it is. It really is. We, you know, the rot of the left is real, and is and is it's losing. It's starting to lose because it's it's a false religion that has come to its natural end of its life cycle. It can no no religion that uh, there are two kinds of religions that can survive: the tyrannical kind and the um, the true kind and the tyrannical kind like Islam uh, keeps its hold on people by being tyrannical and the left is trying that now but let me tell you something we, we're not a people that um, will stand for tyranny very long and so you're going to lose you're going to lose you can impeach Trump you will still lose you will lose probably worse I mean, you know I've heard it said before that Don, Donald Trump is an imperfect messenger for a message that has you know has arrived. So what happens when you get a, a better messenger? For, you know, I listen to somebody like Dr. Steve Turley, Turley online, and I would suggest that you go subscribe to Dr. Turley, T-U-R-L-E-Y, Dr. Steve Turley. You go listen to him, and you listen to how he talks and what he says. And now he doesn't have the money or the power or the influence to become president. But you get a guy like that to become president, and that's the end of the left. Donald Trump, for all his communication skills, and Scott Adams happens to think he's the, um, the greatest influencer who ever lived. I'm not sure about that. Uh, but, you know, you get somebody who's more Reagan-esque, and you're done. Because your ideas are rot. They don't work. The left's ideas are not good, and they will never be good. A bad idea cannot be held up by tyranny. Eventually, it gives way. The termites keep eating at the, the base, and eventually the house falls. It just can't stand up. You think you can use these companies to get rid of an Alex Jones or get rid of somebody else in, um, on the right or get rid of everybody on the right, and you know what? It doesn't matter. You can't survive it. You can't because your ideas suck. It's the bottom line. Socialism doesn't work. Um, the you know political correctness is a, is a horror show. You know, uh, identity politics and intersectionality are insanity. 
uh, the constant increase of the victim groups of the LGBTQ, RGH, whatever, um, all those, you know, you can add as many letters as you want. It just becomes more absurd. You're not going to last. You're not going to win. You can't win because ultimately there's only two things you can do. You can either take your philosophy and die or you can take your philosophy and kill. But either way, eventually people are going to get tired of you because your philosophy is built on a lie. And what is that lie? You know, we often talk about the far right, the far right. What does the far right mean? Let's listen to Owen Benjamin earlier. Owen Benjamin, comedian, very funny guy, very smart guy. You should check him out. Um, and he says, he said something that was pretty profound. What he said was, we was talking about the far right, and the far right being like these racists, these Nazis. But that's not true. On the scale, on the political scale of left and right, you have, on the left, you have total government. And on the right, you have no government. That's the far left and the far right. Now, here's the thing. Total government... I've been saying this for a long time. It's not Owen Benjamin. This is me. The far left is, their philosophy is built around utopia. It's built around state-sponsored utopia, state-enforced utopia. And so communism, obviously, is on the left because they are trying to have an economic utopia, right? Now, all these utopias, by the way, turn into dystopias. They all turn into horrible places. Because that is the nature of utopias. They break down. There's only one utopia, and that is the utopia of the kingdom of God. That's it. All of the utopias turn into hell on earth. That is it. To live in a Christ-centered way is the only true utopia. Okay? And you can only enter that utopia freely. You can't enter that utopia by force. That's theocracy. That's theocratic uh, utopia. It doesn't work. It's also on the left. But the Nazis, the Nazis are not far right. The Nazis are also state sponsored utopia the nazis are the utopia of racial purity they are a utopia built upon race rather than economics in the way that uh communism is they are both state sponsored utopias they're both on the left that's why they're the national socialists that's what they are the national socialists but they're socialists in a racial sense they're cultural marxists on the left they're more cultural Marxists than they are economic Mar Mar uh, Marxists. And so you have on both of these sides, the left is tries to f force, tries to imagine, tries to create a utopia on earth. And they do this at the expense of freedom. They do it at the expense uh, of causing a tyranny. Because generally speaking, if you allow people to be free, they will not always choose to do the thing you need done for your utopia. So therefore you must force them. You must force them through taxes, you must force them through violence, you must force them through um, coercion, you must force them through uh, intimidation, but you always must force them. The right, on the other hand, when we talk about the right, we talk about the conservative. What are they conserving? They're conserving limited government. Isn't that the, the whole argument for the right? Limit government. Lower taxes. What does lower taxes do? It doesn't just um, help with small business. That's not just the reason. It's starving the beast. It's starving the government from their ability to control the people. It's starving them of their power because they have less money. They have less of your money, therefore, and they have less of the control over you because they have less of your money. Now, that means that you're freer to do things. You're also freer to be a jerk. And you're also, um, there are also less goodies in it for uh, other people, but there, you know, that's basically it. So you have anarcho-capitalism on one side and you have socialism on the other. And the difference between these two, the no government and the total government, is the difference between the left and the right, or the right and the left. So, the problem that we have with the left is they've created a lie. They've created the lie that uh, on the right, on the extreme right, are racist. But that's not true. The left has always been the racist. They are the racist. Their entire philosophy is built around racism. And even when it's not built on racism, it's built on hatred of another. They are, they are always subjugating a group, a group. Look at Marx in general. Marx says we have to get rid of the evil capitalists. We have to get rid of the rich, these bloodsuckers. That kind of language, that kind of us against them, is endemic of all left-wing philosophy. It is. It just is. You cannot be a leftist in good standing and not hate somebody. This is what, When I realized this, I stopped being a leftist. Because I'm not a hateful individual. I just don't hate people. I can't hate the rich. Oh, you got to hate the rich. The rich are using us. The 1%, the this and that. I just can't do it. I'm sorry. Let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. I do not have the stomach. You want to have a revolution? You say, you want a revolution. You say, you, you say that? Here's what a revolution is. 
You have to go into the rich man's home. You have to slit his wife's throat. You have to put a bullet in his head. And then you have to go find his children because they're going to come back for revenge and you have to kill them. If you don't have the stomach to do that, don't talk to me about your revolution. You say, oh, eat the rich. You walk around with a sign, eat the rich. Really? Okay. You see, I don't have the stomach for that. I, I don't want to eat the rich. Really? I'd rather be poor than eat the rich. I'd rather be hungry than eat the rich. You know, and here's the thing. I'm not hungry. You know, even when I was homeless, I wasn't hungry. Oh, I'd have moments when I was hungry, I guess. But I was never so hungry that I thought, well, you know, I'll just turn to cannibalism. <laughs> that sounds like a good idea. But, you know, everybody, when I was homeless, everybody around me was rich. Every single person. It was interesting. I was so poor that everybody around me was richer than me. So what was I supposed to do? Hate everybody? Really? Because you're going to hate everybody equally. You're going to hate the people who are, who are who mistreat you. You're going to hate the people who are indifferent. You're going to hate the people who would help you. I don't have an in me. I don't have an in me to hate. The left is entirely about hating. It always has been. It's always been an us versus them philosophy. Whereas on the right, it's about, it's not about hating so much as it's, as it's, as it's uh, you know, do for yourself. Do for yourself. If you hate anybody, hate yourself. <laughs> now, there are problems with that as well. But it's, it, it's not the same kind of problem. Because it's not directed toward the world. You know, it's not directed toward the world. You don't have this thing where you say, well, I have a problem. Therefore, it's the fault of the Jew. Or I have a problem. Therefore, it's the fault of the black. Or I have a problem. Therefore, it's the fault of the white. Or I have a problem. Therefore, it's the fault of straight people or cisgender people or women or whatever the hell else your issue is with somebody else. You don't do that. You say, if I have a problem, I have a problem. I'm the problem. See, sometimes when I look and I say, well, I don't have much in my audience, and I look out and I say, well, it could be because of this, that, and next thing, next thing. And then I ultimately come back to the same thing, position. What are you doing wrong? Well, maybe, you're, um, maybe your videos are not attractive enough. Maybe they, maybe they need to look better. So I'll, I'll try that, see if it works. And ultimately, I'll keep doing that until I find out whether it really is somebody else's fault. But the first, my first inclination is, I'm not doing the job. I'm not getting it done. That's a certain kind of mindset that you don't find on the left. They always blame outward, never inward. Whereas on the right, the blame goes inward first, and then only then outward. It's a different way of looking at the world. And it's also, on the left, they try to <clears throat> create utopias because, and there's a reason they try to create utopias on Earth. It's because they've given up on God. They've given up on the utopia of the afterlife. You see, when you have no heaven to look forward to, then everything, then it doesn't make sense to suffer on this planet. Not for anything. It doesn't make sense to fight in a war, you know, for your freedom. Because there is no afterlife. It doesn't make sense to, um, you know, to, to suffer for children. You know, that's why people on the left don't have children, or they abort them all the time. Because why would you suffer for a child? Why would you do that? Anyway, I'd like to close here with a prayer for um, my... Uh, my friend uh, Deanna's uh, granddaughter. Uh, she's, you know, having some trouble. She's uh, turned away from Christ, and uh, so I'd like to just uh, do one our Father, if you'll bear with me, and and then we'll uh, finish up. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Dear Father, look after Diana, Diana and her family, especially Mary Lynn. Please bring her back to Christ. We live in confusing times. Please try to take the veil from our eyes a little bit. And let her see the mistake that she's made and come back to the true path. Amen. Okay. Well, this has um, been a longer one I've been doing lately. And, uh, you know, please like, comment, subscribe, share this. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for listening. And as always, God bless you.